An air and sea search is continuing for possible survivors of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a 729-foot ore carrier, which apparently broke apart and sunk last night on Lake Superior. The ship and its 29-man crew vanished in a storm with 80 mile an hour winds. She was overloaded by 4,000 tons, even compared for summer load lines. We all know a ton is 2,000 pounds, right? But not mm -hmm. in the shipping industry. It's called a long ton, which is 2,240 pounds. So she was hauling 58 million pounds of taconite, but she wasn't designed for that. And you take all this tonnage that they've had. Now, you've got to ship two football fields long by 75 feet on a beam, and you're adding another 4,000 tons to it. As long as you've got your reserve buoyancy, which the Anderson did. He said his whole ship was under water six feet, except for the bow and the stern. But she popped back up. The Fitzgerald lost her reserve buoyancy when she bottomed out a Caribou shoulder and knocked that hole in the ballast tanks. They couldn't pump it out fast enough. Air compresses, remember that, you know, water does not. And when he bottomed it, it shot them vents off there like a rocket ship. And, and I... Captain Cooper said, hey, <clears throat> if you sag the ship, <clears throat> excuse me, if you sag the ship, you are not going to break that fence rail. But if, you, if, if you're coming out and you hit her, hit her shoal well, like this, it'll snap that fence rail like crazy. Now, on that dive by, by Fred Shannon, by the way, that reminds me. Yeah, see this? Fred Shannon himself gave me that hat. That's from the Expedition 94. Well, he's, well, he was a retired police officer, been a police officer for 25 years, and he had a passion on the Fitzgerald, and... Uh, he actually dove on it, though? Was yeah, the crew? submarine. That, yeah. I showed okay. you the Jim Clary pictures there. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, his, yeah. that's him and that submarine, and, and the crew. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that said that uh, the actual wreck is farther apart than the Coast Guard said, that there's definitely dings, big dings, in the back of that stern. The Coast Guard never reported on that. Uh, that might suggest through. going aground somewhere. Exactly. That's what that, exactly what that suggests. Now, you think about the engine room is going to be a lot more stiff. It's going to have a lot more support than is the middle of that boat. Because they just had screen bulkheads. You see, it was made for ease of loading and unloading. It's that simple. And boy, she made Columbia Transportation Company a lot of money over the years. Because it could haul so much. I yeah, mean, yeah. It, it broke... At least six seasonal haul record, right. records the Edmund Fitzgerald did. And the reason they were able to do that, because uh, Peter Paulson was a captain. He Before would put McCormick. just enough fuel to make her down at Toledo so they could haul that much more cargo. And water was high back in them days. I'm telling you what, where Maumee Bay State Park is in Toledo, there used to be a whole bunch of cottages down. There was a whole community. And the storms came in and wiped them all out, so the state bought them up and put Maumee Bay State Park in there. And didn't they have fewer bulkheads than most bulk Great Lakes freighters then? Um, you talking about the Fitzgerald? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and most most have five. Five cargo holds with, 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 with the ensuing regular bulkheads. I can tell you, on a steel, you can get down, they'd lower this big bulldozer down in there, and, and we'd clean up the rest of the taconite. To get to the next hole, there was a door that you had to walk in. It was solid steel. The Fitzgerald had screen bulkheads. That's why she would do this, and she would do this. And when you do that year after year after year. They rode her to death and put her away wet. And that's a real shame. It's a real shame because when she, she they needed her the most, she didn't have it no more, you know? It's like uh, it's like an old ball player or baseball player, you know? You can only throw so many balls and strikes and your old arm starts to go out on sure, you, you know? Sure. So the Coast Guard at that board of inquest there, one of the head guys there, they, they asked me, 
why didn't you have more boats that could go out? He says, budgetary cutbacks. They didn't have, what's the Coast Guard's motto? Semper paratus, always ready, always prepared, right? Always ready. They sure weren't on November 10th. Now, if I may add one other thing to this. 1989, we're tied up in Rogers City. Whatever watch it was, and then the next morning I wake up, and who's right beside us but the Arthur M. Anderson? Yeah, I mean, I got about eight hours before I got to go and watch, so I'm going to go down and hop a cab and get in there. I want to see what Rogers City looks like, you know? And I'm getting in the cab, and I hear this voice behind me, hold on, hold on, hold on, what the heck? Can, I, can I share that cab with you? And I said, sure, come on, let's, we're going to Rogers City. Turns out it's the chief engineer at the Arthur M. Anderson. And it also turns out that the night the fifth went down, he was a third assistant engineer. So he was on it. And he was on it. I wonder if he's still alive. I don't know. I'm getting goosebumps in my legs just talking to you about this. And we start talking about it. Now, here's where it really gets strange, folks. I mean, this is really freaking bizarre. We talk about the Fitzgerald, and everything's fine. He didn't talk too much about it, but it's a bad storm. What I told him, my uncle was went down on that boat, and my dad used to be the chief engineer. That was the end of that conversation. He looked at me and says, I am not allowed to say another word about this. Do not ask me any more questions. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know that. He said, that's it, that's it, stop this camp. He jumped out, and he walked the rest of the way. 14 years later, and they're not allowed to talk about it? Think about that one. I mean, I'm giving you straight stuff here. This is no BS here. This is straight stuff. 14 years later and they can't talk about it, we got to get a lot of some crew members that went through it. I don't yeah, know how we're going to do that. But it well, would be. I, I, am, I am actively searching, seeking, <laughs> wondering if there are any crew members left alive that were on the Anderson that night because they would be fascinating to sit down with. And maybe someone out there knows that's listening right now. Is there anyone left? from the crew of the Anderson that was on board November 9th and 10th, 1975. Well, there's got to be. My brother Tom's still living. I, he I was know, a 20-year-old kid, so there had to be some deckhands that were probably that, about that age, I would think, you know. Uh, those big waves that, that took the Fitzgerald down ended up breaking over the top of Sault Ste. Marie's locks and flooded downtown Sault Ste. Marie to the, to like on, on the shoreline to one foot deep. I can tell you this, when, when the Sykes got into port where it was going, they no more and got the ladder down, and here comes the attorneys. And they get up in the panels, and the first question they ask him, what do you think caused the loss of the Edward Fitzgerald? Massive incompetence, not on the part of the crew, but because of the deferred maintenance and stuff. You don't have a ship working like it's been up, if it, You can take it back to the shipyard if you got problems like this. You don't keep going on with it, you know? Uh, complacency, you know. They didn't want to hear that. It, didn't, it did not fit. I mean, they didn't even call him to the Board of Inquiry. And he was the third ship there. Don't you think they'd have called, uh, they called everybody in Anderson. They called, well, they couldn't go to the fist. But uh, gross negligence, that's exactly what he called it. Gross negligence. And they didn't want to hear it. And the Coast Guard, their final report absolved everybody of everything. Because had they had they definitely said it was Columbia Transportation's fault, they'd have had multi multi million dollar lawsuits and it'd have been the end of Columbia Transportation, which is they're out of business now anyway. So and I think they settled eight hundred thousand dollars because like I said before, my aunt got six hundred bucks, but unfortunately, after so your aunt, the widow of your uncle, uncle Ralph, Grant, uncle, yeah. uncle Ralph Grant Walton, yeah, they offered the crew six hundred bucks. Six hundred bucks yeah, because it's a federal deal here. And unless you prove negligence, you could not sue. Then you could sue for millions of dollars. Now, if she got, because it said they got $800,000 settlement, or that's what they were held liable for. Now, if she got more money from that, you got, I don't know, that I don't, because we lost track with her. She, she just like, hmm. that was it. I never saw her again or heard from her again, so I, I don't know. But don't forget, Captain, damn it, I'm sorry, Paquette, okay. Paquette, that's it, Paquette. <laughs> <laughs> He anchored behind Isle Royale, and that's what the Fitz should have done. So it cost you another, you know, it was like $50,000 a day to run them ships, you know. Well, 50000 is a lot cheaper than losing the whole doggone boat, not to mention losing the people. Oh, man, that's a shame.
it, it's a shame. And I agree with what the capitalist like said. It was gross, gross uh, incompetence, gross negligence. But how are you going to prove it? They're all gone. Mm. But Captain Cooper knew. He watched the whole doggone thing. And once again, you read about shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. Here comes this snowstorm. So many of these things happen and there's big snowstorm. And you came up with a very good point. She might have loaded up with ice and snow. And it was a tipping point along with that big wave that set her down. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I worked on the Great Lakes for a dozen years. And uh, the, the tugs I was on, you know, we worked all winter. We broke ice, you know. And I know that when we were in an open sea, the ice, the water would come onto the boat and it would freeze instantly. We had to constantly chip it away with axes, baseball bats, and sledgehammers mm -hmm. because it would, you know, it would give the tug too much weight and you'd eventually roll the dang thing over. So ice was a problem for us and we had to constantly pay attention to it. Oh yeah, there's a name for you to look up. Richard Orgel. Who? Richard Orgel, O-R-G-E-L, he was the second mate. Not when it went Not down. Not when it down, obviously, no, but he had been in previous years and he testified at the... Uh, at the Board of Inquest there. So whether or not he's still living, I don't know how old he was, but uh, there's got to be more people out there. But I'll, I'll never forget that chief engineer. He just flipped right out when I told him I had somebody law. That was it. He's not allowed to say another word. Why is that? That's very, very strange. Very strange indeed. But 14 years later. Why is there a million-dollar fine to go anywhere near the first jail? Now, what are they, what, seriously... There's nobody to sue anymore. You can't do that. Why Why is this big open? There ain't, the average diver can't go down there 530 feet. You can't do it. It takes special, you know, stuff. The dispute is is that it's been deemed a memorial gravesite to right. be to be untouched. It's not like, it, it's, it's not that, hey, we can go down there and figure out what happened and we can find more clues and that may be true. Uh, but I think the story is put to rest in that regard because it's now deemed officially by the Canadian government a memorial grave site. And I ah, doubt that's going to change. But. You just sparked something there, buddy. <laughs> Fred Shannon had more up to date. Now remember, they, had, they didn't get into really Loran C, you know, until the, until, until the uh, that early 80s and stuff. They had the old Loran A. But with GPS coming in at its infancy, Fred Shannon says that the bow section is in American waters and the stern section is in Canadian waters. Isn't it's that actually, interesting? It, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Like the bow's in America and the stern's in Canada. It's like right on the line, you know, you see? What so nobody ever comes out with these facts and figures, but they're all in front of us if you just do some digging, you know? And, and then Whitefish Point... Uh, Maritime Museum did a dive too. That's another excellent, excellent. Although Fred Chan's video is is much clearer. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can you can see this. They do a great job on this. Even the maritime one, you, they're looking in the windows and stuff. It's all damaged. Uh, uh, the ceilings came down. You know, a bunch of and, and when the water came in the pilots, they pushed everything in the chart room. And that's something else. Like uh, Red Ber Bergner said. The emergency thing that they could have called in was on the chart room. It wasn't the radio was next to Captain McStarley in the bow, right there in Pilot by the ship's wheel. But the emergency thing was in back of the chart room, and so boom, when they water came in, they, the, Captain Cooper even said they they hit a big wave. They thought they were going to come back up. When they hit that big wave, whoosh, that was it, and the ball game was over at that time. I I can see both sides of this though. <coughs> Excuse me, personally. I understand, especially from a family's perspective, and you come from the family, uh, your uncle went down on it. Uh, I, I can understand why, hey, let's leave this thing alone. It's a memorial grave site. The 29 men are still with the ship. 28, maybe, there was a, a one found floating outside the ship. Yeah, it was him. We already know who it was. Pretty good idea who. Well, for the most part, mo 28 men at least are still on yeah. the ship. It's a grave site leave it alone the other side says hey but if we dive on it we can based on modern technology we can figure out what exactly happened i guess i'm asking at this point this many years later coming up on the 50th anniversary doesn't matter anymore how it happened can it just stay a gravesite i don't think they should they should disturb i mean those 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 staterooms are are like a mausoleum they're uh 
Don't mess with that. Don't have to say absolutely not. You wouldn't go to a graveyard and start digging things up. It'd lock you away forever. But I still say there's no nothing wrong with going down and getting that logbook and coming up and have it and restoring it. It's going to fill in some missing blanks. They did that on the, what did I tell you, was the morale of their Bradley. One of them they dove down. The Titanic, for God's sake. the morale. They got the okay. logbook out. They, they brought up this guy's diary from the Titanic. It had been under the salt water for 100 years. And they were able to, able to uh, salvage that. And it, it was readable. Why don't they want you to know that? I'm telling you, it still has to do with liability reasons.